Hello, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this uh, live session. Uh, this is one of the live sessions that Khalifa University is organizing uh, regarding the research we are doing on the, on the COVID-19 uh, relevant topics. Uh, basically, my, uh, to, today we're going to talk about how mathematical modeling can help us understand, decide uh, uh, what kind of interventions could be uh, of good, uh, of good, uh, a good result, and uh, to deal with this outbreak we are we are having. My name is uh, Dr. Jorge Rodriguez. I am a faculty in the Department of Chemical Engineering in Khalifa University, and I have been working on modeling, mathematical modeling of biological processes for a number of years. Uh, we normally, in my lab, we work on a topic which is not in topics that are not directly related to epidemiology. This is our first work on epidemiology uh, that has been so far uh, attracting some attention, and we are humbly trying to make a contribution and trying to help uh, Abu Dhabi and every and all the other places in the world to tackle this this problem. Right. So today, what I want to do in the presentation, I, I I'm going to be trying to pr uh, provide some background on generally what, what models are and so on, and what kind of, what kind of models are there. And then I will, I will present you what is uh, the work we have been doing, how we have conceived that model, and some of the, our preliminary results that I hope you find interesting. And I'll be very happy to take questions at the end of the session. Okay, so um, when we're talking about uh, modeling of epidemic outbreaks, I mean, these days we are hearing in the news all the time that the, the politicians or decision makers are being informed by experts and communities of experts, right? So those experts, uh, sometimes they mention that they have been running models or they're doing simulations of how the outbreak is going to progress and we are hearing all the time talk, uh, talk about the flattening the curve, what curve, what, what is all that meaning, right? Where are all these models coming from? So this is something I'd like to introduce you a little bit, uh, a bit, little bit today. So the first question I want, to, I, want to, I want to ask is, I want to answer, is about the idea of what is a model, okay? We're going to be talking about what a model is, and then I will try to summarize quickly what kinds, what types of models we have in, in the literature available these days that people are using for epidemiology, right? Okay, so when, when somebody tells me, okay, I do mathematical modeling, some people get really uh, very frequently very scared. Okay, that sounds complicated. It's, it's a very complicated thing. So what is a model? What is exactly that? So, well, models are nothing else than representations of reality. So a model is an abstract representation of reality. So when we build a physical model of a house, they do it in, in, the, in the architecture schools, right? They're all playing with the, with the little models of house. That's actually a physical model of the reality. There are other types of models of real systems or real problems, right? You can do a, a computer model of, uh, of, of anything, of a character, uh, or you can do a blueprint. In engineering, we do, we do blueprints. When you want to build something, you just make a model of it on a piece of paper, such that can be used for the uh, actual uh, delivery or use of the, of the, of the thing you, you're building, right? So models are nothing else than that. What are mathematical models? Mathematical models is one more type of those models that we can make of things, right? So um, the, the only difference now is that we are, what we're doing is we are representing the reality using mathematical expressions. And those expressions are typically made of uh, variables that are uh, key in our, in our system, the equations that make those variables interact with each other, and the, uh, some parameters that we might have to adjust to uh, or find out how they work so th those equations and those uh, models work uh, correctly. Okay. Normally, uh, when we think about, okay, I'm going to do a mathematical model of a system, then typically we start thinking, okay, how, how complex is this going to become, right? How, what, what amount of complexity do I need to throw in, right? And then it, this is one, one, one habit that is, is, is difficult to remove, right? This incentive of adding complexity. Okay, I want to add more things into a model. I want to make it more complicated. Because when we do that and it doesn't bring value in a model, it's adding too much complexity and too much work and it makes it difficult to handle and it makes it difficult to understand, right? At the end, what I always tell my students as well is that the objective of the model is the most important thing. So when we make models, we make models for a purpose. We make models to serve, to tell me about a prediction. We make models for, uh, to know about a process, to, 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 to calibrate, to, to design. We can make models for many things. That objective is what is going to define how complex you need to make the model. So that's an idea that's uh, always to, to keep in mind when we do models. And then, no matter what type of model we are doing, we should remember as well that all models are wrong because they are not the reality. And it's actually a temptation uh, from modelers that we all went through that uh, we tend to fall in love with our models and start thinking that the reality is wrong because it's not fitting my model, 
right? So this is a kind of a habit that we also have to fight. We, I, I want you to keep that in mind that when we look at models now, when we see some of the curves, we need to always remember that those models are wrong. They are just some representation of reality with its limitations. Okay, so now we have, uh, we have of course, in epidemiology and uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the disease outbreaks, we have, uh, we have mathematical models to show us uh, a number of things, right? So what are those mathematical models uh, used for in epidemiology? What can be? You, we could use them to understand a little bit better what, uh, to gain understanding on, on, on what's uh, happening about the disease outbreak, how it works, right? So by modeling the disease, we can actually get, gain some knowledge about it. One of the main applications these days is to predict what's going to happen in a week from now, right? The, the time course of the outbreaks. We want to know what, where the curve is going to be in terms of number of people ill or number of uh, fatalities in a few days from now. So this is a classic application of these uh, models. They can also help, for example, predict how many beds I'm going to need in intensive care, what kind of resources I'm going to need, because if the model is telling me some things about the future, I can actually also uh, estimate needs that I'm going to have uh, regarding the uh, resources that I'm going to need. Right? One other application, which is what we focused on, on, on this work, was to understand what is the possible impact that some interventions are going to have. So basically, it's, we can use the model to answer what if questions. What if we do this? Then you can simulate that scenario because you have the model for that. What if I do something different? You can do another simulation and evaluate that scenario. So in that way, this what if questions is one of the one of the main applications. Can, they can be used also to manage uncertainty. You can also use the model to say, okay, what do we need to measure? How many tests we need to do? Shall I do this type of test or the other type of test? Is it going to be more useful the information if I do a sero seroprevalence test or I do a PCR? Is that is that going to be a different type of information? That could be also one of the applications of a model. Okay, and then. When we look at the approaches here, there are two main ways of doing this, right? So we can either, either uh, make a model which is called deterministic, or we can make models which are stochastic, and of course we can make something uh, which is mixing both parts of it. What is the meaning of deterministic models? Deterministic models are those that are producing one single result when we feed our parameters and our initial conditions at the beginning. It's, no gonna, it's not going to be any randomness. Stochastic models are going to produce a range of probabilities and a range of confidence in terms of the results. And they will be able also to handle the uncertainty better. So in epidemiology, I, I, I can tell you a little bit, just as an introduction, what kind of models have been used uh, over the years, particularly deterministic models. The most famous and most popular one is the SIR model, which is kind of, uh, is, is, is the, the well, one of the most simple compartmental models that can, that can be out there, right? So the, in, in this idea, the, 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 the SIR type models, what they do is they separate the population in compartments. So they are compartment models, right? They look at the people, okay, am I a healthy individual? Am I an infected individual? Or am I already recovered individual? Okay, so the, this is what, where the SIR comes from, from susceptible, infected, and recovered individual. So what these models do is they basically model the rate at which a susceptible individual goes into the infected, so that's the rate of infection, and then the rate at which the, uh, the, the infected individuals recover later, and then they become immune. So this is one uh, basic type of model. It's already an old, uh, it was developed in the, in the early uh, 20th century. So this model has been around for a while, and then it has created lots of variations of the model itself, right? If we have diseases that, for example, La, la, like the measles, where you have uh, not on, you, you're susceptible, but you need to also be exposed, right? So you can also decide, okay, I'm going to make another compartment because I, I think there is sufficient complexity here that needs to be captured, in the sense that some people might be actually uh, susceptible, but might not be exposed, okay, or might be exposed later. So you introduce that additional step in the middle. So this is the case of the SEIR model, for example. Other models that have been around for some time is, for example, the SIS model. And this is an example of something in situation in which you can get it infected and then you recover, but you don't become immune. You're susceptible again. So this is classic case of maybe the common cold. So we get a cold, we survive it, and next year we, we, we're going to get it again. So, or, or, or later, in a few months, we're going to get it again. So this is a case of what we're moving between susceptible and infected forwards and backwards. And then, of course, there are more, uh, more o o other models that you can increase the complexity. I will show you later what we did in our, in our work. And 
here you can include things like quarantine, so you can have this variation of a, of a SIR model with, a, with a exposed, with quarantine, and with hospitalized. So you can keep adding compartments. And basically, what happens with these models? When we solve the equations of these models, they are telling me, over time, they're showing me, in a, in a time course of time, what is going to be happening with the numbers of individuals in each one of the compartments. So as you see in the, in the graphs here, so in the blue, the blue is showing the, the susceptible, and initially everyone will be like susceptible, there will be no infected, no recovered, and then as people get infected, the infected numbers go up, okay, and then the susceptible numbers go down, but the infected numbers don't go up forever, they start slowing down, because what's happening is as you become infected, you cannot be infected twice, or if you recovered, you cannot be infected again. So the curve slows down, and then you see this, in, this intermediate behavior, like with, with a maximum and then going down, which is the curve of the infected numbers. This curve is similar to the curves we are, uh, that are being discussed these days for the COVID-19. The curves we want to flatten is particularly one type of infected individuals, which is the ones that are in critical care. Because if those, the peak of the curve of infected, which are hospitalized or in critical care, is very high, it exceeds the capacity, and then those people will not be receiving the care and very likely will become fatalities when they could have been saved. Right? So this is the kind of curve we're talking about in the, in, in the graph. Okay, then uh, what are typically the assumptions of this kind of models? If we want to use these models, we again, we need to remember what I said at the beginning, which is that all models are wrong, including these ones. So they are wrong because they make assumptions. Okay? We need to make assumptions to be able to use this model. So what are the main assumptions of the SIR type of models? These models are assuming that, uh, for example, the, 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 main, uh, the main assumption here is that they are homogeneous and e everybody is the same. So they are talking about averages, right? Average rates of infection, average rates of recovery is all about the average. Okay? And therefore, they work well when we have large sample, right? Average approach, uh, I mean, they are a good representative of, of, of population when the sample is big, as you might know from statistics. So if we have a very small number of individuals, then this kind of models are not going to be okay. And if the individuals are very homogeneous, behaving very differently, the models are not going to be good. So we need to be aware of that. This is where the, the, the limits are for the, the application of those models. Then obviously the rates at which uh, uh, the contacts between individuals happen are proportional to the size of the population. And then these kind of models, uh, they are assuming also that the population is closed. So there's nobody coming from outside or, uh, or going outside or or, or being born in this, in this particular version of the model, or, or um, so the population is not changing in any other way other than moving between the, the different compartments. Okay. Obviously, uh, we will talk a little bit later, you can of course run many of these models for different places and then you can add later on this migration term that I'm talking about now. But as they are now, the SIR typical models, they are closed, so they are, don't, they are not considered the migration. Well, what's the meaning of this? Well, if we need to have for population homogene uh, homogeneity. These models are not good when the uh, infections, the scenarios are occurring in, 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 in different clusters which are far away from, it, from each other. We might have a place in which the infection is in a very advanced stage. We might have another place in which the infection is in a very different, much earlier stage. The average of the two is not going to be meaningful. We should be running or simulating the, those two places separately. Okay. Then. Uh, also, in this kind of models, uh, every interaction between individuals is treated as, as the average, right? It's treated as the, same, as, as the same thing, which means it has a limitation. If you have uh, particular events or super spread events, you have a, a football game or, 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 or people going to the mosque. These kind of things where a lot of contagion can happen could be actually uh, not captured by these kind of models because these models are all about the average, right? And then what these models require is they require for us to know something about the disease. If they are deterministic, they are going to have some parameters. We need to know, uh, we need to know rates of infection, we need to know um, times in each one of the stages, we need to know how many people are going to become more ill than others, and all those things are very unknown sometimes at the beginning of, of an outbreak. And this is the case where we have COVID-19. Good news for us, as you will see later, is a lot of knowledge is being gained by the day, and we know more and more. Okay, so this is about deterministic models. I wanted to also talk a little bit about stochastic models, which is not, it's not my main area of work, but the, the stochastic models are also very important in epidemiology and they, are, uh, they have been around also for a while. And those, th those models are basically uh, very frequently talking about, uh, you know, dealing with, with these nodes of individuals, okay? 
and uh, they, they create these networks of nodes. So it's a very different concept than having these groups of populations with an average, right? It's basically uh, more like a network of nodes, okay? Uh, sometimes the, the parameters of infection in this kind of stochastic models are not really a number, but basically a probabilities. And then you start uh, introducing probabilities in these stochastic models, and then you will end up with sort of a probability result as well, right? So this is good and useful to handle uncertainty. When we have uncertainty, we introduce things as probabilities, and then we, we receive kind of probabilities uh, outside. Okay. In this case, these models could be run like for each node, could be one of these SIR models that I was talking before, and then we can have uh, the connections between the two of them. Okay. There are different types of uh, ways the, the probability can be computed, and, and so on. And those models, typically, they will produce not, not the clean curve, as we saw before, right? They will produce these curves with like a density of probability of uh, of what could be the, 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 the situation that we are predicting in, in the model. Okay. So in these models, what, how they assume the disease transmission, they assume it as a stochastic process. They assume it is a random process. Okay. Uh, people and communities are represented as nodes. Some nodes are more connected than others. This is also possible to capture here. It was not possible to capture it with the SIR model. And then, again, the infection between nodes is captured by probabilities. Okay. And then the main thing is that you don't get a single solution, you get a range of solutions in stochastic models, most likely. What could be the, the main limitations? As they, they, they might require uh, more computation than the, the, than the other models, they, especially if they have lots of nodes. And then uh, if you want to have accurate uh, predictions, you also need to have accurate information about the probabilities, so like everything. Okay, so that's basically the introduction I wanted to provide before talking about our work. So we have an idea now uh, about what models are and uh, what kind of models are these days being used in epidemiology. So the, the second part of the presentation, what I wanted is to present you what we have been doing in, um, in, in our re research. We, we started this research very recently. Uh, once this started, I, we became interested in this and we established a very nice collaboration with other, uh, other colleagues here in Galifa University from the Faculty of, of Medicine. And uh, what we did is to develop a model, which is a, a type of SIR model, okay? And we added some uh, uh, different things that I will be explaining in a minute, uh, which we thought they were important for the characteristics of the COVID-19 um, outbreak. Uh, the, what we did is very quickly, we, 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 we published a preprint, and then we, this is available for everyone that wants to read it. And all the software we are producing and everything we are running and simulating is completely open. So anybody can just replicate it directly. This is one of the things we wanted from the beginning. We wanted to, all the information to be open and accessible for everyone. There's nothing really we want to, to, to hide here, especially in a situation like this. Okay, so what we did in, in our model is also classify the population and the individuals in terms of their uh, stage of infection. Where do they belong, right? So an individual will belong either to a healthy population, which is fine, it's, it's susceptible, but it hasn't been infected. It can be also infected in different levels, okay? And then it could be also hospitalized, it could be critical, and it, or it could be already recovered, or it could be a diseased individual. Okay? Any individual at any time step or any time moment is going to belong to one of those situations. Okay? This is the main, main thing. Also, uh, well, I, I can actually t tell you a little bit of what those stages are. Okay? So if an individual gets, becomes infected, okay, and we will talk about how the infection is described in this model, we, 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 we make it join a group of, of uh, of individuals which, are, which we, we are calling non-infectious presymptomatic individuals. Okay? This was actually added very recently. As the new knowledge about the COVID comes in, we are trying to incorporate it in the model as soon as possible. Apparently now what seems to be happening with the COVID is that once you get the infected for a few days, you are not infectious to others until maybe a couple of days before you develop the first symptoms. So now we, we, we thought it was important to capture that compartment as well. So this is the first compartment now is becoming infected, but not yet infectious. After those days, those th four days or so, you become infectious to others, but still you don't feel your symptoms. And this is what, what we call in the presymptomatic infectious um, individuals. Later, if you develop symptoms, then you become symptomatic. Uh, from any one of those stages, any individual, can, a fraction of individuals, actually a proportion of individuals, will recover directly. And we know this, uh, we are hearing in the news that people, some people are getting the virus and they are not even knowing about it. Mm -hmm. So you will be basically recovering right away. 
but if a fraction of, th of those individuals will not be recovering, right? And they will keep progressing in severity as they move forward, right? If you develop symptoms, then two things can happen now. You're symptomatic, you can recover, or you can go to the hospital. These are the kind, the, the kind of, of, of steps we're assuming. And then these proportions of individuals, we are getting those data from the epidemiological information which is available worldwide. And we are continuously improving those parameters and those percentages to always have the latest, uh, the latest information on that. A hospitalized individual can then again recover or he could actually become a critical ill individual. And then again, out of the critical in the, uh, the individuals, there will be a proportion of them that will recover and there will be a proportion of them that will unfortunately die. Okay. And again, all those fractions are available from epidemiological data that we are seeing everywhere. What we included in the model as well is that if a critical individual does not have available intensive care units or resources, it's going to always become a diseased individual. So this is one of the things that we incorporated in the model as well. A main difference uh, that provided for us very interesting results was that we decided to do this by age group, which is I'm showing in the next slide. Uh, we did the grouping of individuals not only by showing to which group of this, uh, I mean, which stage of the infection you belong to, but also to what's your age group. And that's what's very important because from the beginning, it's very clear that the impact and severity and mortality of the COVID-19 is very different for old people or for young people. So we, we were uh, able to access information in the online regarding the, I think the next slide needs to be shown, uh, the one with the age groups. Yeah, I think so. So, and then the, the, what we did is obtain information from, from multiple countries which are reporting the different cases and the different stages by age group. And that helped us to come up with those fractions of parameters which are specific by age. This produced very interesting results and helped us also evaluate possible interventions that can be done by age group, like letting certain age of individuals of certain age only do certain activities and not others. You know, we will we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so then, additionally to these uh, steps, what happens is that we have different time duration of the, uh, of, the, of the steps. So when individuals are symptomatic or when individuals are in hospital, then we have the average times that we also obtain from clinical and epidemiological information worldwide. So what's the typical time that somebody is spending in a hospital before becoming critical? What's the typical time for a person that is going to recover to recover? All those average times, we included them because they are going to be defining the dynamics of our curves when we, when we show the simulations later, right? So all those parameters, fortunately for us, they keep improving in quality. So we have a lot of uncertainty, but there's a lot of people that have been infected around the world, and then many countries are collecting huge amounts of data, and all those data are actually be available. And there's no reason why they are going to be very different from one place to another. If this is a property of the disease, it should be, uh, I mean, most likely they will be not completely different. So we can actually build certainty and build confidence as the time goes on. Okay, so then I wanted to show a table of, of the parameters with, we were using. All those fractions that I was talking about before, they have, uh, I mean, we took, we took the values that are the latest values we found in the literature regarding what percentage of people are moving when you're, let's say, when you're hospitalized. Okay, what percentage becomes critical, what percentage recovers, right? all those fractions in each one of the steps we collected and we, collect, and we collected by age group. And this is where the difference show high. In this, in this figure, you see the green, the green side on the left in, on the table are the lowest values for the fractions of people moving into more severe uh, stages. And on the right, which is applicable to the elderly, to the people over 60 and over 70, we can see how those percentages of individuals becoming critical, hospitalized and, 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 and deceased are much higher. So in that way, we have captured the age, uh, the age, age different behavior by, by changing those, by, by having different numbers per age group. Th that was one of the main characteristics of the model. And the parameters at the bottom, in principle, we don't have, we didn't find significant information yet. They are the different times, average times of all those clinical stages. But it probably very likely, as the information comes in, we will have different times, maybe for the time that a child spends in one stage, might be different than the average time than an old person or uh, people over 80 years old is actually spending. So as the information comes in, we can always plug it in again. Okay, so how did we model then the infection? So that's uh, shown here in the next, in, in this slide. 
So the rate of infection in SIR models is, is modeled in a similar way, right? So it's basically a function of interactions or co contacts between individuals that are infected or infectious and uh, individuals which are susceptible, right? In our case, what we did is to have a multiplication of four terms for the, um, for the, the, the to, to calculate the rate, the rate of infection, right? So if you see the first term on the left, which is the, 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 the people in gray, they are all the susceptible individuals. Uh, I think the, we have to show the slide. Is this the slide, the, the correct slide we're showing? Yeah. So the, the, the susceptible individuals, which are the ones in gray, okay? So the rate at which we have infections in one day is going to be the product of the number of people that can be infected, okay? Then it's going to be a pro multiplied by the number of contacts that each one of those people, on average, have per day, okay? If I have many contacts per day, I'm going to have more chances for uh, infection. And then we multiply that by the proportion of those contacts which are with, with infectious people, right? So the, the proportion, if there are a lot of people infected in my area, I have 10 contacts, well, maybe nine out of 10 are infected, I have a big chance. So this is basically what we are capturing there. And then we multiply by the probability of infection by contact, per, per, per contact. So if I have an interaction with an infectious individual, what are the chances that I'm going to be infected? You can see immediately that the, we can do we can do things to, to, to change those numbers very easily, right? In, in terms of interventions, which is what I'm going to show in a minute. So if we look at how we did that in our model, so how we captured these interventions in the model is basically by uh, acting on those parameters, right? So in the next slide, you see the um, three possible interventions that we have uh, that we have worked uh, we, we wanted to describe from the beginning. The first one is the most commonly applied in, in, in worldwide these days was the, uh, the isolation of the population or the confinement of the population. Okay, so that one will act on the uh, number of contacts that an individual can have uh, per day. Okay, uh, as we see in the slide, the one with the, I think the next slide needs to be shown, if this is the one. Yeah, thanks. The, the isolation and confinement will act on the number of contacts that you have per day. So if you're in your home, Right? You, you're not interacting with as many people per day. So you see that those arrows are like, there will be less contacts per day, so you're lowering that number. Another possible intervention, if everybody wears masks and we use PPE equipment and we are doing social distancing, this is the one on the right there, you will see that the probability of having an infection when you actually interact with an infection individual decreases. So you, you end up lowering also that term by that intervention. Okay? Other possible intervention is that we also evaluated is if everybody is tested or we have a lot of testing being done, people are aware that they have been infected. So if you know that you are infected, you, you don't have any symptoms, you, you don't know you're infected, but you might be spreading the disease. If you, were, if you have been tested, then you're, uh, you will know and therefore you will immediately quarantine yourself or you will become quarantined. If that happens, that means that the, the proportion of those people that are infected, because they are aware of it, they will not be outside interacting with others. So that fraction of infection individuals will decrease. So we also capture that intervention by decreasing that fraction of, of, of infection individuals. In that way, either of the three interventions, as you see, is going to decrease one of the three factors. And then, therefore, you will have a lower rate of infection, which is what we're trying to do. So how we model the, of course, the interventions, we, we, we just created some variables and parameters that, that, that try to describe that. We model the, 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 the intervention as the number of average co contacts or interactions that an individual has per day. Okay. And we did also pi per age group, which allows us to, let's say, confine differently or have different numbers uh, for the different interventions for people of different ages. Okay. We also, for example, we assume that children and, uh, and young might have a little bit lower uh, parameter we call the LPA, the level of personal protection and awareness. So they're a little bit less aware. So children are playing, they're not going to be careful because uh, you know, they're worried about contagion. So we put lower numbers for those uh, ages than the uh, adults, for example. Okay? This can be captured because we are doing it by age group. And then, uh, yeah, if we have the, the quarantine and so on, we can reduce the factor of interaction, which is the last two parameters. Okay. So let's look at some of the results, right? So what kind of results did this model can produce? So what we can get immediately are basically the curves over time, okay, the plots over time of the susceptible non-infectious. So each one of the compartments that we have created for the model will give me a curve over time. 
So I can dy dynamically simulate when you put the, all this in a differential equations. We solve the model over time. We have these plots, right? So we can see how the susceptible go down. I mean, this is a, a simulation example, a simulation result for a, a half a year, for example, of, of an outbreak with the, with the default parameters we, we decide to use. And this is assuming that everybody gets infected really quickly, right? This is a, a scenario with no intervention at all and everybody very mixed with each other and everybody interacting with 10 people on average per day, right? In that scenario, this is the result, what the model will show, right? So we see how the susceptible goes down really quickly. In, uh, in, in like a month, everybody has been infected already. And in, in all these other intermediate curves that go up and down, they are the basically when you become symptomatic and then go down and then hospitalized and go down. And then the critical one is the lower one. And then the number of fatalities is also shown, and then we can see how it progresses. On the right side, I actually plotted the, not the totals, but per age group, what is the, the curve for critical cases. So we can see the critical cases per age group. And you see that all the curves go up, and there are some curves that are right in the middle there, because we are assuming that if we exceed the capacity of intensive care, those individuals that are good at being critical are not critical anymore because they don't have any ICU bed. So they, are, they have moved into the, into the disease very quickly. And they correspond to the, to the higher, uh, the older ages. We are assuming that the, the, in case of excess of capacity, uh, some countries were doing the, the, the allocation of resources by probability of survival which means if you have less probability of survival, and, and, and unfortunately it was happening with, related to age, they were allocating the resources to the, to the higher um, survival rate. Okay, so I want to show a little bit about the, our results regarding the impact of those interventions. Okay, so the first one is the impact, the, the first intervention we evaluated is the, inter, the, inter, the impact of the isolation of the population, because it's been the one that it has been uh, done more uh, broadly, right? And on the left graph, I'm showing the number of, the average number of interactions that you have per day. So the more we are in the right, the less isolation we have. And the more we are on the left, the more uh, isolation we have. As you see, and I'm plotting three curves, four curves actually in this case. The first one is, the, the blue one is showing what would be the fatalities, the number of fatalities that we would have at the end of the outbreak if we apply that level of isolation to everybody, the universal is called there, the universal, if the isolation is applied to everybody, we see how the curve is reaching over three and a half percent with these numbers, there will be fat fatalities. If we de increase the isolation, we move to the left, we're gonna see the curve going down, and then eventually if we lower below one interaction over day, we see the impact is very high, the number of fatalities will decrease because we will be seeing a situation that you can see on the right how the, the curve is flattening. Okay, the curve of critical cases that is shown on the right. There is one curve for, for each one of the, of the levels of isolation that are shown on the right. So you see how the curve flattens as we uh, apply isolation because things are happening much slower. Okay. Why the fatalities are less? Because everybody has intensive care when they need it. Okay, that's basically the main, the main reason of the increase in fatalities here. The interesting result on the, on the curve on the left is that the isolation of only the highest uh, fatality rate uh, groups of population, which is the elderly in this, in this, in this case, which was almost equivalent to isolating everybody, which means the impact of not isolating the young population was very minimal according to this original simulation. Of course, this uh, is only a qualitative result, but it's showing uh, what we know somehow that if young people uh, get infected, they don't necessarily uh, are going to have a very high fatality rate. But what is very clear is that the uh, older people definitely need to be isolated and protected because if they get infected in a high percentage, in a too high percentage, they will not, uh, they, they, they will not make it. Okay, so that was the, uh, our main result on the, on, on regards of the, uh, impact of population isolation. A second scenario, uh, second intervention that we described is, okay, what if we have a widespread use of masks and personal protection equipment and so on, right? So we wanted to represent that as, uh, as uh, what, again, what would be the, the final number of fatalities on the left graph as a function of increasing the use of personal protective equipment, okay? And we see the curve uh, um, on, the on, on the left showing how, you know, after, if we have that, that use up to a number of 
basically the number, the final number of fatalities will be zero because if we have 100% protection, it means zero probability of infection, which means there will be no infection. That's of course unrealistic, but then we can see how the impact, the curve shows that there is an actual impact on the on the number of fatalities. On the right side, I'm showing the the each one of the curves is for for one level of protection, and again the reason is the same story than before. We have final lower number of fatalities because the curve is more flat. The curve of critical cases is more flat. As if we use protective equipment, we slow down the rate of infection. The rate of infection happens over a longer period of time. We don't exceed the capacity of the health system, and the fatalities that can be avoided can be avoided actually. Okay. So, and then a third one that we wanted to look at is by uh, is regarding this uh, this self quarantining when we are aware of the of the of the of the infection, right? If we do wide press, wide, widespread testing of individuals, they will become more aware. More people will become aware that they are infected, and they will quarantine themselves. So, so you see again the same impact will happen, right? We have a curve on the left. The more uh, awareness we move towards the left. In this case, we. The, the, the factor, the smaller it is, the less you, you are, you're going to be going out, so it's a reduction factor. And then we could decrease the number of fatalities also dramatically. If everyone is aware that is infected and quarantines, then all the infectious individuals are going to be home. They're not, not going to be interacting with, with susceptibles, and then that's how you interpret the result. And again, the reason for that is, again, that leads to a, flatten, a more flattened curve of uh, critical cases. Okay. All right. So we, we, we evaluated those three, uh, those three interventions, but we also wanted to see what the impact is of the availability of intensive care units, because the, you know, it's one of the main decisions to, to evaluate okay, what level of capacity we have to make to have ready to, to, for, I mean, um, to have readily available uh, to, 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 to protect and to, to, to cure as many people as possible, right? So what we did is we, we, we plotted those number of fatalities and, and, the, and also per age as a function of how many intensive care beds are available per million, okay? In European countries, uh, places that I know, places like Spain, I think the numbers are around 250, uh, around that number. Uh, obviously, probably these days they are trying to increase it as fast as possible, so I'm basically plotting then what the impact would be in terms of the number of fatalities uh, in, in our scenarios that we just simulated as we add more intensive care beds, right? The, the slope we, we saw there uh, with the, the current parameters was eight, which means eight people across the entire period could perhaps be uh, cured if there is a, a one more additional bed of intensive care. That was the result with our parameters that of course can be very different in very different places. Okay, so intensive care units definitely save lives directly according to our results and we probably all understand that this is a very clear conclusion. Okay, and then just to, to almost finish, uh, what we also wanted to simulate a little bit is the what-if cases for de-escalation. Okay? When are we ready to remove the isolation, right? So what we did is we look at the uh, reproduction number. The reproduction number uh, is a variable used in epidemiology very broadly, okay? They, it basically represents the number of um, individuals that get uh, the disease per individual that gets the disease. Let's say how many, if I, if I become infected across the entire period of my infection and the disease and so on until I recover, to how many other individuals am I going to be uh, passing the disease, right? Uh, we might be hearing in the news that everybody is looking at the R0, this reproduction number is called R0. And it, if we apply interventions over time, the R0 will be changing, right? So it's not the basic reproduction number, it's the dynamic reproduction number. And then uh, it's, it's understood by uh, everyone that the reproduction number needs to be below one for an epidemic to not be spreading. So if, we are, if I'm infecting, on average, every individual is infecting less than one individual, the infection eventually will decrease, right? If every person is infecting more than one individual, it's clear that the whole thing is going to go uh, go up, right? So what we wanted to represent here is at what point are we going to stop the, let, let's say we, we simulated starting from an isolation situation, we're going to drop or withdraw the isolation measures and let everybody again go back to normal, okay? And when 
we want to represent that by looking at the R0. So for different values of the R0, we, we said, okay, what if I stop the isolation at with R0 equal to 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3. And in the graph of the right, we can see what happens. Right? If we do it too early, with values of R0 which are above 1, we see how those curves of critical cases can actually peak at different moments in time. Right? So what we want is to make sure that we do this uh, withdraw of the, uh, the, the measures or the interventions at the right time. If we do it too early, we, we can actually describe the consequences of what could be happening in terms of, of those peaks coming back. So this is being discussed these days. In many countries, they are looking at uh, eliminating some of the interventional restrictions to the population. Uh, the timing of that and also being able to, to monitor very closely what's happening with the outbreak to maybe go back very quickly if it's necessary. Adding other things like the use of masks everywhere. So maybe we can compensate one, uh, one intervention with the other. Perhaps we say, okay, we can increase the number of interactions by letting people out. But maybe everybody needs to wear a mask, there's social distancing, and maybe we do a lot of testing. So if one factor increases, the other two decrease, maybe our rate of infection, we can maintain it in a low number. Okay, that's basically what all the, all the experts and epidemiologists and, and modelers are actually trying to, trying to do these days uh, uh, intensively. Okay, so uh, what are our next steps at the moment? What, what are we doing on a daily basis? We're doing a number of things. What we're trying to do continuously is to have this pipeline in place in which we can incorporate the new knowledge that is coming about the disease directly into the model. Either by adding new compartments, by changing the structure of the model, or by basically updating those numbers of parameters that we have uh, been uh, using in the simulations. So as new epidemiological information comes, we know more, we bring better data. The better quality data we plug in these models, the better results more accurate, more true, closer to reality results we will get. Because we, of course, we shouldn't forget that all the models are wrong. So how wrong we are is going to be about, about uh, the quality of the data that goes in and the quality of the model equations that we're using. So we're trying to increase that, that confidence on the parameters as the epidemiological information comes in. Our next steps are, we, at the moment, we're running the model in one cluster for one simulation which is uh, for one population which is assumed to be closed and homogeneous. What we want to do now immediately is to run multiple versions of the model at the same time with interaction between them. This could be the case of different cities that are nearby. Let, you can take uh, two or three cities in the UAE, for example, or communities or clusters. So they have the simulation running in parallel and then there will be ma ma migration terms, travel, or transport in between them. And we will try to evaluate interventions uh, in terms of, for example, uh, should travel be allowed? Is, is travel a big problem? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Uh, how, to, how to evaluate the impact of that is something that we're going to be doing immediately in the next few days. We are lucky that we are working uh, as well with uh, already, uh, trying to assist and as much as we can to SEHA, the Abu Dhabi Health Services company. Uh, we're also, uh, as part of the team, there are uh, people from Daman and people from the Department of Health. We are having regular meetings every, every week trying to, 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 to provide uh, you know, help to, to Abu Dhabi to, 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 make, to make the right decisions. They are doing already a, a incredible work. We, 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 can, we are seeing firsthand how, how difficult is the situation and we are really, we're really happy to be part of this. And if, we can, uh, if our results are going to be helping them, this is, the, this is one, of the, one of the things we really uh, would like to have uh, as, as an outcome of this, of this work that we are doing. Uh, as to, just to conclude, uh, I wanted to, to, to let you know that we also implemented this model in a simplified version of it on a web site, which is interactive. That means that you can actually go to that website. Any, anybody can go to the website. The URL is, is shown in the slide. You can uh, input your parameters for the interventions, and then you, can, uh, you get the graphs updated for your particular simulation. So we wanted to do this as, uh, I mean, we, we, we believe that the communication of these models to the public is important. It's good that people understand what we are doing and why this, uh, the, the governments are, are doing things, for example. It helps being successful if we all understand why things are being done. So we, we thought that communicating and explaining well the model it was important. And we think also that the, the, the science behind the decision making also should be open to everybody to, to, to be able to scrutinize it and to be able to, to to, to see it, and uh, in this website, for example, I, we hope we, we, it contributes to it and um, it's of use. 
All right, so I'd like to thank you for your, uh, for your time. This is all I have to say today. And uh, I think it's been a few questions in the, in the system. So I will be, I'll be happy to take, uh, to take those questions. I think they're going to be passing me some of them by, by email. So if you let me uh, check it quickly. I have a number of questions here from you guys. Okay, so I have a few of them here. Okay, the first one, uh, the, the names are not there. So it says, uh, what does a model of the UAE's coronavirus curve tell you about how the outbreak is progressing? When will it peak and what could be the limitations of this prediction? Okay, so uh, how the curve is looking like, we, we, are not, we are not yet having the data that is going to allow to uh, run the simulation at, uh, at the moment for, for the UAE. Well, one thing I'd like to say is, you. You're asking about UAE. So I, I, I would say that the, the model for a country, for an entire country, one model, one SIR model or this model, trying to describe an entire country is not perhaps the best idea. The best idea is to describe the clusters of population which are close already. So I would, what, what we will do, we will not do just one simulation for UAE. What we will be doing is a simulation for Abu Dhabi or some areas of Abu Dhabi, maybe Dubai, or the, different, the different places where population are there. because. In, they might be in different stages of the curve. So having an average will not have an, a, really, a, really, a really meaningful uh, situation. The, the, the idea with the data m m might sound easy, but it's very difficult in, in, in the situation we are. The health services are saturated. Just to collect all the, those data and present it in a way that is, of course, anonymous and, 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 and safe for everybody and provide it in to, uh, um, into us, into the modelers, so that we can actually run predictions is, is, is a more complicated job than we thought at the beginning. And we are realizing that with the meetings we are having with, with SEHA and the, and, the, uh, and the other entities. So it's not an easy task, but we are actually working also in Halifa. There is, in Halifa University, there is a, a project now on the data management and the data science associated to this, which is led by, by some colleagues, and we will be working together with them. As the data will come in, we will be able then to be talking about predictions, and those predictions will be shared with the with the government and with SEHA, and then hopefully uh, we'll get a, a, an idea of what's happening. The, you're also asking about the limitations. The limitations of the predictions are going to be associated to how we do this, right? If we try to run it as um, as an entire country, probably we're not going to be very accurate. The limitations are going to be the limitations inherent to the modeling, and the limitations inherent to the data. If the data are accurate. The better data we put in, the better, the better, um, the better simulations we'll get. There's another question. How will the recent ease of movement restrictions in the UAE affect the curve given the current amount of cases? Thanks. Again, uh, in terms of numbers, we, we, we cannot tell you. In terms of how it could affect, we, we, we saw the, la the last curves. That could happen if we are too early. If we are too early, maybe. the another wave could come. And that could happen everywhere in the world. Many countries, they are already starting to release and withdraw their, their interventions slowly because it's, it's really hard. Countries like Spain or Italy, people have been locked for a month already. Okay. But they are very closely doing, doing this slowly, associated to other interventions, as I said, and they are very closely monitoring. So we might have to go back. And we have to realize that this is a possibility that can happen. Uh, these models can help. That definitely, but they are not going to give us the, the certainty. You need to closely monitor what's really happening. Another question: Could models like these will be you? This be used to predict and maybe prevent future pandemic outbreaks? I would say that that's more a stochastic thing. This is actually a deterministic, uh, deterministic model. Another ab ab outbreak is is a big unknown, right? It's like what's going to be the stock market looking like in the next. Uh, in the next year or two years, right, or in, in a week. At the end of the day, what happened is some people predicted that, that this might happen, but when is a big uncertainty because, of course, this is, a, this is the forces of nature, right? We have, we have, if we are making this easy to happen, and this is happening by, 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 by those places where animals enter in contact with people and the, the way we have our lives in, in a glo and the globalization, this makes the the, ra ra the, ra the rise of viruses that could be potentially problematic easier than before. But I, I, this kind of modeling, I don't think, is, is the kind of modeling that is going to help us with that. Um, I have another question here. I understand that the parameters of use of the personal protective equipment is with the consideration that is adequate, perfectly used, and so on, of course, yes. Uh, or is a, pre a percentage of efficiency. Yeah, that's a good question because now we are modeling those interventions with, with, with single numbers, right? 
but on itself, each one of those numbers can become a, a, a sub-model if you want. So if you want to develop more the, the use of PPE, the impact of personal protective equipment, then you can develop equations of the efficiency of the use, the number of population that is developing, so you can grow a little model inside it and add that complexity. At the moment we are just assuming a parameter that captures the entire, the entire, uh, uh, the entire process. If more knowledge is there, is when you can add that complexity. If not, we basically throw in factors and factors over factors, and then eventually all of those numbers we need to, to make them up, right? So, as I said at the beginning, as a good model in practice, uh, I, I try to always fight the complexity until it's really necessary to add it. Because when you bring it in, you bring in also lots of speculation in the parameters. So when, as this comes, and there are of course people in epidemiology and, and working on, okay, what was the meaning of closing the schools in terms of average number of interactions, right? This is itself another model inside this model, okay? That, that could connect in this, in, in this same kind of structure. Uh, let me see if there's some more questions here. I have another wave of questions here. Sweden, question about Sweden, which I was actually reading this morning. Sweden's controversial approach is to increase the infected and developed herd immunity among the young. Is this affected to flattening in your models? Can we evaluate the risks of doing this? This is one uh, very nice one because I have been uh, having myself a lot of thoughts about this as well. One people could say, okay, uh, it could be better if, if every, every young person gets the infection as fast as possible because then we're all over it, we cannot get it anymore and we don't infect our grandparents, right? This could be one approach, but that's kind of a, big, uh, a bit of a risky one. Sweden is having a little bit of a le less, uh, you know, less restrictions. It, they, I think the government allowed everybody individually to kind of do their own their own thing, and their number of fatalities is true is much bigger than the neighbors. But in the long run, we don't know whether that's going to be actually a more successful approach or not. I think we need to wait till the end of it, because even countries that are saying, "Yeah, we're doing great, nothing's happening." Uh, we, we're going to see the, the picture in the long run. So, uh, to, to be honest, I, I, I think we will have we have to wait. Uh, uh, this is my uh, my answer to this. And regarding your question of whether the model can actually evaluate the risks, absolutely, we can just simulate the scenario in which we do we do Sweden. So we don't isolate the individuals too much, and we let things flow, and then we can also simulate the other more restrictive scenarios, and then we can compare results in the long run. But we, of course we don't, ha we, we don't have to forget that people are trying to get a vaccine, right? All these simulations we are doing are assuming that nothing changes, that we don't know anything, that, that we're not going to have a cure, and that we're not going to have a vaccine. If we gain time enough, maybe in six months, then everything is over. And then I think then uh, it was no need for doing this uh, infection of, of so many people if we get the vaccine early. But if the vaccine comes in two years, then maybe this herd immunity might have been a good solution. Again, I think we, we only have to, to wait. Uh, another question here, how quickly can a proposed intervention be evaluated by the model and then implemented in a high level of confidence? Well, evaluating an intervention, uh, it doesn't take a very long time. As long as we have the data, we, we just run the simulations. It's not a big, uh, it's, it's computationally very inexpensive. The simulations run really quickly. How to implement it is a matter of what, what the intervention is and, and how is it going to be uh, implemented. If it's a de decree from the government, this could be done in the day probably, so you, you, you don't go out. If it's masks for everybody, then you need to actually get the masks to everybody. That could be a problem. In some places, th this is becoming a, a difficulty. If it's doing tests for everybody, then the same story. You can do it as fast as you can get the tests available for everybody. So I guess it's more a question for... Um, for um, all of us, actually, all, all, the, all the stakeholders that are uh, in place there. Um, one question, do you work closely with researchers in biology, molecular biology, how the research will help you? In this particular topic, we are not really working directly with, uh, with the fundamental science behind the virus. Well, we're working together with epidemiologists, with uh, Dr. Juan Acuna, as you, you, you might have seen in the, in the collaborators list. He's bringing the perspective of epidemiology, which, which was needed. If you remember, I, I mentioned I was a faculty in the chemical engineering department, so this is actually not our main area of work. But the principles of the modeling are the same. The ideas behind the model uh, and how you build the model 
how you apply to chemical engineering on two other areas, they, they, they're they not fundamentally different, right? Uh, no, so we, we're not really incorporating that. What we're doing is re continuously reviewing the literature. So what is the latest science that we have that can affect some of our parameters and some of the values we're doing in the we, we, we are uh, applying in the model. Uh, it's a question about geospatial technology. If we are using geospatial technology, not yet, but that's coming. As soon as we start doing the different nodes for the different cities, could be for the UAE or for other countries, we're going to start using, uh, incorpor bringing in that geospatial, uh, those geospatial elements uh, one by one. Also, our um, collaborators in, in the project for the, the data science, they are, they, they are using a very advanced tools to, to actually geo, geolocate also data, and, and that, that will become part of it, most likely. And then somebody's asking about if we're working on a simulation for Abu Dhabi and what are the results. Yes, we are working. We are trying to build that pipeline of how the data is going to get in a way that we can plug it into the model. And then once we plug it into the model, we can produce results that are useful for Abu Dhabi. So yes, we are working on it. We don't have the results yet. Uh, and I have a, I think, a third set of questions that came over here. One question says, are you trying to collect an accurate database for Abu Dhabi and all the Emirates? So I think that this was answered in the, in, the, in the previous questions. So yes, the, not ourselves, together with the uh, entities that collect the data, because it act, it's actually a, an extremely complex thing, and how to get the data and how to get the data according to the data protection of the privacy of people. You know, the health data is a complex, a complex matter. So we're working on that, and together with Khalifa University's data scientists as well a team of data scientists. Um, does this prediction count the risk of people living in crowded areas, like sharing rooms? That's uh, captured primarily in these kind of models by the average number of interactions that an individual has per day. I would, I would answer that. Then you could tell me, okay, but what if in a city there are people that are living in areas which are really, really, uh, let's say, close to each other all the time, and then in areas which are not as much? Then I would say that we have to run separate simulations of the model for the areas that are in that situation and the areas that are in the other situation. And then you, you, we can just have those curves running in parallel and then you just add them together or, 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 or make them interact in that way. So it's possible to do it and uh, it's basically described like that. Okay, I think I don't have more questions. So I would like to wish you all a, a blessed Ramadan. I hope everybody stays safe. Uh, you and your families and uh, uh, hopefully uh, the, the presentation and the questions and the discussion was useful for, for you and we all go through this uh, through these difficult times the best way. I mean we are here in Khalifa University trying to, to contribute 